Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We'd love to have you get your Bible and join us today. Uh, as I prefaced our last lesson that when, in chapter 11 of First Chronicles, we're going to pick it up today in chapter 12, verse 1, but we back up in time in chapter 12. In chapter 11, David was already at Hebron, uh, and at that time, Saul was dead. Now we back up to in time to when David was at Ziklag. So in other words, chapter 12 is out of chronological order uh, following chapter 11 because we back up in time to when David was at Ziklag and Saul was still alive at that time. In our last lesson, I mentioned the ferocious warriors that David had in his ragtag army that began at 200, uh, grew to 400, then 600. In today's lesson, we're going to see that it grew to, to hundreds of thousands as he became king, not only of Judah, but all of Israel. And I mentioned these fearless warriors in chapter 11. David was no slouch himself. Uh, in fact, is, uh, it would be the fact when David wanted to build the house of God, it was because he was a man of war, a man of blood that, that had brought much blood on earth is the reason that God told him he wasn't going to be the one that built his house. But David, for example, was not one to sit back and watch others do his fighting for him. Uh, you had the incident when he was but a youth and the champion of Gath was ridiculing the armies of Israel, mocking them to send out their champion to fight. Not one of them would do so, but David, being 16 or 17 at the time, said, I'll take on that giant. And the giant, David, what did David say to Goliath? He said, you come to me with your spear and your sword and your shield. Uh, that's in other words, that's where you put your confidence, Goliath but I come to you in the name of God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel. In other words, that's where David put his confidence. Another example of David's bravery uh, when he wanted to marry Saul's daughter, Michal. Saul was trying to get David killed and he said, okay, David was a poor shepherd boy. He didn't have the money to put up a dowry for a king's daughter. Uh, and what did Saul do? Saul said, I, okay, you don't have to bring me money. Bring me the foreskins of a hundred Philistines. And I can assure you there weren't 100 Philistines who were willing to line up and make a donation to David's dowry fund. Uh, he had to kill them. And did, did, what did he do? He brought 200 foreskins to Saul. So uh, David, not a, a, a slouch in the war department himself. So we're going to back up. We're going to ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. We back up in time. David is at Ziklag, and this is a chronicle, uh, a list, if you will, of those who came to David at Ziklag. Chapter 12, verse 1, we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 1, and it reads, now these are they that came to David to Ziklag, while he yet kept himself close. This means enclosed or held back. He was running for his life from Saul. Saul wanted David dead because of Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men. This is Gibor in the Hebrew language, helpers of the war. Ziklag. Uh, allotted originally to the tribe of Simeon, and they ended up losing it to the Philistines. Uh, on two occasions, David took refuge uh, at Ziklag. In fact, is Achish, the king of, G of Gath, 
uh, a Philistine gave David Ziklag and they were there a period of one year and four months all told. But, um, and you remember the first time that David met up with the quiche, David faked that he was crazy. Uh, he scribbled on the gate of Gath, the sit gates to the city, and he allowed uh, drool to dribble down on his beard and they brought him to Akish, and Akish said, what are you bringing that crazy man here for? What do you want me to do, take him home for dinner? Get him out of here. But it ended up that David and Akish formed quite a relationship. Uh, Akish was convinced that Saul was David's enemy. David probably would never consider Saul his enemy. He considered him to be the anointed king of Israel. But Akish thought that David was Saul's enemy, and what do they say? An enemy of my enemy is my friend. So uh, they had quite a relationship together. In fact, as Akish trusted David so much, he was uh, going to allow him go to, to go to war against Saul. Uh, more on that as we work our way through this lesson. Verse 2. They were armed with bows and could use both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow. They were ambidextrous, even of Saul's brethren of Benjamin, even out of the tribe of Saul. And now this word brethren doesn't necessarily mean family. Uh, what we're talking about is members of the tribe of Benjamin. And many people were becoming displeased or disgruntled with Saul. They, they saw that Saul was taking the nation further and further away from God. Uh, uh, and that was not pleasing to many people. So I think that's how we explain why we even have people out of the tribe of Benjamin uh, coming to David. Now we're going to have a list of those of Benjamin who came to David at Ziklag. The chief was Ahizer, uh, then Joash, the sons of Shimei, uh, the Gibeathite. These men were from Gibeah, which was Saul's hometown. And Jaziel and Pele, the sons of Asmaveth and Barakah and Jehu, the Antothite. Uh, an Antothite means that someone is from Anathoth. Uh, Anathoth was one of the cities of refuge, one of the priest cities uh, in, in verse 4. And Ismaiah the Gibeonite, a mighty man among the 30, over the 30, and talking about the 30 heroes of chapter 11, and Jeremiah, and Jehaziel, and Johanan, and Josabad, the Gidirathite. And uh, Gidir, Gidira, I should say, is a city in Judah. Uh, but that shouldn't throw you how Benjamites could be coming from a city in Judah, because it was common that uh, tribe members would reside, uh, sojourn is the word that they used in uh, the territory of another tribe, so that don't let that throw you. Now, this Ismaia, it states that he was a mighty man among the 30 and over the 30, but if we didn't cover them uh, name by name in our last lesson, but if you search the verses covering the 30, you don't find Asmaia, and it's thought that he must have been killed in battle uh, before the list was chronicled in chapter 11. Verse 5, Eluzai and Jeremoth and Bealiah and Shemariah and Shephatiah the Harufite. Verse 6, Elkinah, now these are Levitical names here, and Jesiah and Azareel and Jozer and Joshobim the Korthites, and now that we know why they were Levitical names, because if they were of Korah, and you remember Korah was uh, of the Kohathites, he was a cousin, first cousin to Moses and Aaron. And in Numbers chapter 16, you may recall Korah challenged Moses and Aaron. He said, you, you two take on too much of yourselves. And he wanted to take over some of the responsibility 
of running the nation. And he also wanted to take over some of the responsibilities of the priests. You remember he and his 250 burned incense. That's a function that's reserved for the priest and the priest alone. Uh, it made God very angry. Uh, and then Moses told uh, the people, you separate yourself from Korah and these men, the Reubenites that were supporting him, because what's going to happen is going to happen to you unless you do. And that's when the earth swallowed up her mouth and swallowed Korah and his troop whole. Now, evidently, some of Korah's children obeyed Moses and moved away from uh, Korah and did not get uh, swallowed up by the earth because we have the singers, uh, the sons of Korah, all throughout the Psalms. Verse 7, And Jolah and Zebediah, the sons of Jehoram of Geder. And these are all those who came to David at Ziklag, that ragtag army of 200 uh, growing to 400 and then 600. And the Gadites there separated themselves unto David <clears throat> into the hold to the wilderness, men of might and men of war fit for battle. They weren't green troops. They were uh, seasoned warriors that could handle shield and buckler. A buckler is a small spear that when it wasn't being used was carried uh, in a sheath that was attached between the shoulder blades and they would reach over their shoulder and grab the handle of it, whose faces were like the faces of lions, not literally, but they were thoroughly warlike is what this means. It's a figure of speech and were as swift as the roes upon the mountains. A roe is a deer. In other words, they were not only seasoned warriors, but they could move out. They were in good condition. Uh, they were well equipped for war, and they were fast. We had a, uh, we have, I should say, a, a retired commander of the Navy uh, who's a member of our local congregation. He was a fighter jet pilot. And he was telling me that the last time we went through Chronicles that the man in the Navy who started the Navy SEALs studied David's uh, war uh, tactics. And they had to be guerrilla warfare types because David and his men were outnumbered 20 to 1, 30 to 1, 40 to 1 on many occasions. They had to be able to move in fast and hit a target and then get out before the main body of the enemy noticed that they were there, detected them. So I thought that was interesting to note that the Navy SEALs uh, was basically formed with the thought of David's ragtag army of 200. Verse 9, Ezer the first and Obadiah the second, Eliab the third. Now these are from the tribe of Gad, which Gad, uh, Reuben, and half of Manasseh took their allotment on the east side of Jordan. And that's what we're listing here are the Gadites that came to David at Ziklag. Verse 10, Mishmana the fourth, Jeremiah the fifth, Atai the sixth, Eliel the seventh. Verse 12, Johanan the eighth, Elzabad the ninth. Uh, Elzabad means God has bestowed, and God certainly bestowed quite an army on David. Verse 13, Jeremiah the tenth, Machbaniah the eleventh. And all these are important to David's army, but there's one thing that's more important than these seasoned warriors that joined David. That's the fact that God was with David. And, you know, we're talking about uh, bows and shields and spears. Uh, that's all well and good. And there's a war in our future, but you're not going to need a shield or spear. What you need is the gospel armor of Ephesians chapter 6, that helmet of salvation, your, your girt being the Word of God. 
And most of all, you have to have that shield of Jesus Christ, which allows you to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. You want to make sure that you're fighting on the side of God. And David has God in his army just as much as any of these other soldiers that are joining him. Verse 14, these were the sons of Gad, captains of the host. Now don't think of this as a rank in our military. This captain of the host simply means they were chief warriors. They were very good at what they did. One of the least was over an hundred and the greatest over a thousand. And this would easily be understood that uh, the least had a hundred men under him, the greatest had a thousand men under him, but that's not what this means. Uh, it's a, a figure of speech, a Hebraism. And what it means is that the least of those that came to David was able to handle 100 of the enemy by himself. The greatest was able to handle a thousand of the enemy by himself. You remember Joshua Beam, uh, one of the three highest rankings that we covered. Uh, he took out 800 of the enemy all by himself. Verse 15, these are they that went over Jordan. They were on the east side of Jordan and they crossed it. In the first month when it had overflown all his banks and they put to flight all them of the valleys both toward the east and toward the west. Now the first month of the Hebrew year was Abib or Nisan. Now there were times of the year that you could basically wade across the Jordan. Abib or Nisan is not one of the months that you can wade across Jordan. Uh, why? Because it's in flood stage at that time of the year. So uh, the, the message you had to have a little bit of salt to, to take on the Jordan when it was in flood stage. And what about this? Uh, they uh, put to flight all them of the valleys. What they did was after they crossed Jordan, they cut their way through the other tribes of Israel that supported Saul in order to work their way to Ziklag to join David. And there came of the children of Benjamin and Judah to the hold unto David, the stronghold. Now, I can imagine when David saw Benjamites, and you can be assured he knew a Benjamite when he saw one, that he was a little concerned about their intent. You see, Saul's tribe was Benjamin. And David went out to meet them and answered. This word answered is a bad translation. Check it out in your Strong's. It means that he went out to eye them, to put his eyes on them, or to take heed of them, you could think of it. And said unto them, If ye become peaceably unto me to help me, mine heart shall be knit, in the Hebrew this is, it shall be one unto you. But if ye be come out to betray me <clears throat> to mine enemies, seeing there is no wrong or no violence, is what this should be translated, in mine hands, the God of our fathers, look thereon and rebuke it. What David's saying is, I have not used violence against Saul. David had the opportunity on one occasion to kill Saul. He wouldn't do it. Uh, Azahel, uh, or I should say Abishai, one of Zariah's sons, the eldest, had the opportunity to kill Saul, and David forbade it. So what David's saying here is that I have not done anything violent to try and take Saul's life and I'll let God be the judge of me concerning that. God who shields the innocent and punishes the guilty, I'll let him be the judge. <clears throat> Verse 18, then the spirit, this is Ruach in the Hebrew, came upon Amasai, who was chief of the captains. And he said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse. Here he's identifying the one Samuel, or actually the one God chose 
uh, out of the root of Jesse to become the king of all of Israel. Peace, peace, shalom in the Hebrew, be unto thee, and peace be to thine helpers, for thy God helpeth thee, and we're going to help you in the future. Then David received them and made them captains of the band, the gathering army of Yahweh. And there fell, this word in the Hebrew, it means the deserters, some of Manasseh to David. And that's what Saul would have considered anyone who joined David, of course, would be a deserter. When he came with the Philistines against Saul to battle, but they, this is David, helped them, the Philistines, not. For the lords of the Philistines, upon advisement, sent him away, saying, He will fall to his master Saul to the jeopardy of our heads. You can read about this in 1 Samuel chapter 29. And what happened was Achish, who had, David had gained his trust, Achish wanted David to join with the Philistines when they warred against Saul. He knew David had been a high-ranking officer in Saul's army. He knew David would be familiar with Saul's every battle move and would be very beneficial to the Philistines for that reason. But you see, Achish was not the king of the Philistines. He was only the king of Gath. There are five major cities of the Philistines. The other four kings didn't trust David. They said, no, David will turn when he sees his, his, his master Saul, he'll turn on Saul's side much to the jeopardy of our own heads. Verse 20, as he went to Ziklag, there fell to him of Manasseh, Adna, and Josabad, and Jediel, and Michael and Josabad and Elihu, and Zilthe, captains of the thousands that were of Manasseh. And what happened was Achish asked David to return to Ziklag when the other four uh, kings of the four other major cities of the Philistines refused to allow him to go to war. David had done a very foolish thing. He, he left Ziklag unprotected with all their wives, their children. And some, a, a band of Amalekites came by and burned Ziklag, took their children and their wives, and if it hadn't been for the help of the Manassites, which let me read verse 21, which says the same thing, and they, the Manassites, helped David against the band of rovers, the Amalekites, for they were all mighty men of valor and were captains in the host. And there was an Egyptian who was a slave of one of the Amalekites. He became sick and his master left him for dead. Uh, David and his and the Manassites came upon this Egyptian and he hadn't had food or water in three days and they basically saved his life and he helped them on the promise that they wouldn't turn him back over to his master, the Amalekites. For at the end, by the way, they regained, they didn't lose a child, they didn't lose a wife. Everything was restored, uh, fortunately. I think God had his hand in that, verse 22. For at that time, day by day, there came to David to help him until it was a great host like the host of God. 200 became 400 became 600. Now we have to switch gears. We're, we're going back to Hebron. Uh, we're going forward in time again. Verses 23 through 40 are the warriors who came uh, to David when he was at Hebron. Uh, he was there for seven years and six months as king of Judah only. Verse 23, and these are the numbers of the bands, or soldiers, that were ready armed to war and came to David to Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. These, again, are not green troops. These are all seasoned warriors, well-equipped and well-trained. 
and experienced. Verse 24, the children of Judah that bear shield and spear were 6,800 ready armed to war. And that seems a small number for uh, David's own tribe, but they're equipped and prepared. Of the children of Simeon, mighty men of valor for the war, 7,100. Uh, Simeon always closely associated with Judah uh, for the geographic ties. Uh, Simeon basically lie within the boundaries or the borders of Judah. Of the children of Levi, 4,600. What? You mean Levites were armed and ready for war? You bet. And you can imagine these Levites were probably as fed up with Saul as anyone in Israel. Uh, he was disobeying the word of God. He was uh, seeking out the uh, counsel of a familiar spirit uh, and, and leading the people of Israel away from God. You, you can believe the Levites were ready to do something about it. And Jehoiada was the leader of the Aaronites. Now we're not talking about Levites, we're talking about priests. And with him were 3,700. In chapter 27, verse 5, uh, Jehoiada is called the chief priest. Abiathar, <clears throat> though, was the high priest at this time. Uh, when David was at Hebron, uh, there was another high priest, Zadok, which was at Gibeon, where the Mosaic tabernacle was at this point in time. 28, and Zadok, a young man mighty of valor, and of his father's house, 20 and two captains. These probably uh, spiritual advisors, if you will, uh, there to, if, if they wanted to inquire of the Lord, for example, with the Urim and Thummim. And the children of Benjamin, now we're back to Saul's home tribe. The kindred of Saul, 3,000. This is the smallest number of all. For hitherto the greatest part of them had kept the ward of the house of Saul. They appointed Saul's only remaining son, Ishbosheth, uh, the king over Israel for two years. And imagine the Benjamites had, had the king of all Israel was of their tribe. Now there were certain perks uh, advantages that came along with that, benefits, and they were probably a little bit hesitant about surrendering the benefits of belonging to the tribe of the king. So I think that's an explanation why we have such a small number and a lot of them remain loyal to Saul. Verse 30, and the children of Ephraim, 20,800 mighty men of valor, famous throughout the house of their fathers. Now this was the largest tribe of the Ephraimites and 20,800 is a pretty small number for Ephraim. But remember the Philistines had been beating up on Saul and the armies of Israel and God wasn't with them, things were not going well. They had lost a great number of soldiers. 31 and of the half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000, which were expressed by name to come and make David the king. And this would be the half-tribe of Manasseh on the west side of Jordan, as the others will be included with uh, Gad and Reuben uh, from those who came from the east side of Jordan. 32. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200 and all their brethren were at their commandment. Here we have 200 chiefs. And what this men of understanding means that they had sound judgment uh, and they, they were savvy in political matters. They, they knew what to do in a certain situation. 33, of Zebulun, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, with all instruments or weapons 
of war. 50,000 which could keep rank. Uh, that means that they could set the battle in array. They were not of double heart. They were not uh, of two-minded, you could think of. Heart often can be, means mind in the Hebrew. And they weren't double-minded. They were all of a single heart, all of a single mind. And what was their mission? To bring David to the kingship of all of Israel. 50,000 would be the, of Zebulon is the largest number of any of these groups that came to David at Hebron. And of Naphtali, a thousand captains, and with them, with shield and spear, thirty and seven thousand, thirty-seven thousand ready to fight uh, for the king uh, that Yahweh had chosen. And of the Danites, expert in war, and uh, twenty and eight thousand and six hundred, twenty-eight thousand six hundred of Dan. You can tell this is quite an army already. And of Asher, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, forty thousand expert in war, keeping their rank. And on the other side of Jordan, now we move to the east side of Jordan, the Reubenites and the Gadites and of half the tribe of Manasseh, again, these all on the east side of Jordan, with all manner of instruments of war for the battle, and hundred and twenty thousand. So if you tally up all the armies beginning with Judah through the tribes on the, that came from the east side of Jordan, we have three hundred and thirty-nine thousand six hundred, and one thousand two hundred and twenty-two heads or captains. Now, when we get to later chapters in the book of Chronicles, First Chronicles, David would have an army that exceeded 1,200,000. So this army would be about a third, maybe a, between a third, a fourth and a third of his armies at the largest number that they ever were. So this is quite an army that's come together to support David. I can imagine David, who God took as a shepherd of sheep and, and made him a shepherd of men. And can you imagine what he thought when Samuel anointed him king over all Israel? And David is but a youth. And he's saying, well, wait a minute, Saul is still the king of Israel. And he, he, was, he had allegiance to Saul for many, many years. But, and I'm thinking David thought at one point in his time he had to say, Samuel couldn't have known what he's talking about because Saul is still the king. Now I'm sure David is starting to see the overall big picture that God had planned for David. And he is indeed going to be the king of all Israel. Well, we'll come back in our next lecture and finish this uh, chronicle of those who joined David at Hebron and get into our next uh, chapter where we'll see David making the first attempt to bring the Ark of the Covenant up from Kirjath-Jerim, where it had been since the time the Philistines returned it to Israel after Eli and his sons lost it uh, to Jerusalem. We got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Peter. Here we have two books, First and Second Peter, that, that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are three earth ages, that there was one before this one, this one, and one to come. Peter, the great fisherman, which in his gentleness and his kindness brings us uh, two books, the books of Peter, that lead, guide, direct, even in your daily life, that teach and show you how to be happy, how to find that peace of mind, and to know yourself. The books of Peter, I know you're going to enjoy them. 
Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout the United States and our good friends to the north in Canada. If you're studying via the internet or some other means around the world and not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Uh, quite all right to mail your questions in and prayer requests as well. Uh, if you got a question, uh, feel free to call that 800 number and leave it. Uh, we can't take all questions, but I know this, if the Holy Spirit wants your question to be on the program, it will be on the program. Please don't ask questions about another denomination, uh, individuals by name. We try to teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others' names serves no purposes, accomplishes nothing, especially when we're talking about our brothers in Christ. Uh, got a prayer request? We can do away with the 800 number. You don't need a telephone. Talk to your Heavenly Father. Go to Him in prayer. Uh, I don't think you have a lot of competition these days. It's everyone's so busy in this world, making a living, uh, trying to get by and uh, make time each day to talk to your Heavenly Father. It makes His day when you do. It's, a, it's like a child talking to a parent. Uh, sometimes they would have a tendency to ignore their parents and you don't want to ignore God because your relationship with Him depends on you. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look on these, Father. Uh, you know their needs, illnesses, Father, addictions to drugs, alcohol, Father. You know if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions. See what's on the mind of folks. And this person's from Ten Regina from Tennessee. <clears throat> My husband has been studying with you all for about three years. I listen and study with him. I go to a local church, but when Sunday gets here, he acts like he gets mad because I'm going. What can I do to change this? Well, I would suggest that you sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with him. Um, let him know why you like to go to that church. Maybe you feel the need for uh, local fellowship. I, I don't know why, but you do, and you should communicate that. Perhaps you should explain it's important for you to attend your local church and, and what you gain from it. And he should be understanding. Um, perhaps you both should read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, which goes into that subject uh, in depth. Vanessa from Michigan. Is there ever a time when a person shouldn't take communion? No, I don't think so. Uh, if any of us waited to take communion until we were worthy, we would probably never take communion. Shirley from Ohio, why don't preachers teach the book of Revelation? I think it was preached, if it was preached, more people would be saved if they knew more what was happening in the end of the times. I learn a lot from your teaching. I watch you every day. We're glad you enjoy the program. You know, many to teach that the book of Revelation is sealed. When the very name Revelation means to reveal, not to seal. Um, and of course, to teach something, you have to understand it. And I'm afraid not too many people today uh, have studied God's Word enough that they understand the book of Revelation. Pam in Tennessee, I'm confused about helping your family members during the millennium where it speaks of a sister without a husband. If we are in spiritual bodies during this time, how would she even have a husband if there is no marriage there? Why would it matter if she had had a husband in the flesh? And Pam's referring to Ezekiel 44, 25, which states that the Zadok, that's God's elect, uh, during the millennial period can go to their family who didn't make the first resurrection, they didn't make the cut, and try to help them. 
and they can go to immediate family members, mother, father, brother, sister, except a sister who has married. Now the reason it states that because the sister who has taken a husband is no longer in your immediate family, why? Because when a woman married a man, she became part of that family and no longer was a part of her family. That's the reason that that says, am I saying I agree with that? Uh, no, not so much, but uh, that's what the word says. Bernard in Alabama, I have been praying for deliverance of the spirit of heaviness. Someone said for me to get rid of any demonic influence such as rock music CDs. They also said to anoint my home and kick the devil out of my home. I anointed my apartment and my car when I first moved in. Do you believe I need to just throw the rock CDs out? I grew up listening to rock and just have become aware of the satanic influence rock bands convey in the music. God bless you and your staff. Thanks for remembering my staff and uh, we are blessed here. I hope you are blessed as well. I, I don't believe all rock and roll is influenced by Satan. Some of it sure is, but uh, what I would suggest to you, Bernard, is if it's satanic to you, yeah, get rid of it, get it out of your house. But, you know, uh, I, many people enjoy rock and roll, and I don't think there's anything wrong with rock and roll as long as it's not uh, satanic in nature. Peggy in Texas, how do I explain this to men who think it means women? Oh, you quote 1 Timothy 2 uh, verses 12 through 14. How do I explain this to men who think it means women shouldn't be pastors over a church? They say women can't teach or be prophets. I don't see what's the difference. I tried to use 1 Corinthians 11, 5 through 8 but they seem to feel this scripture means women can't lead and have authority to be a leader of a church, only men. Thanks for your help. Hope my question makes the air. It did. Um, all right, Peggy, good question. I would tell them about Deborah. Uh, Deborah was a woman. Uh, she was not only a judge of Israel, she was a prophetess. Not only was she a judge and a prophetess, when no one else would lead the armies of Israel to war, Deborah stepped up to the plate and was willing to do it. All the rest of the army were afraid. Prophesy means to teach. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, we learn that your sons and your daughters will prophesy in the end times. That's when the Holy Spirit speaks through them. Joel chapter 2 will back up what I'm saying. And when the Holy Spirit speaks through your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy. Tell them about uh, Philip's four uh, virgin prophetess daughters. David in Mississippi, the four rivers that flowed from the Garden of Eden were they the four races of the six-day creation? No, that's, uh, they were actual rivers. Uh, the uh, Hittichel, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 10 is what I'm referring to. The Hittichel is the Tigris River of today. Uh, in verse 14, it mentions the Euphrates River. It's still called the Euphrates River today. And then you follow with the second question, wouldn't Cain have been a Geber? A Geber, of course, a giant, which were descendants of the Nephilim, the fallen angels, when they went into uh, the daughters of Adam, normal women, in other words. Um, Order Sargon the Magnificent, a book that we have in our library. Uh, Sargon was a descendant of Cain, and he was a biggin. Gregory in Oklahoma, of the Ten Commandments, the one to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy makes me wonder how do I keep it holy? I think it means that since God created everything for us, we should have a certain reverence for what 
he made and to thank him for it. Am I on the right track or not? Well, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, which is, it was where you'll find this commandment given to keep the Sabbath holy. The word holy in the Hebrew is kadash, and it means to be clean. Uh, also, it's translated in the King James Version Bible as sanctified or, or set apart. And of course, when it comes to the Sabbath, you should be aware of Hebrews uh, chapter 4, where we learn that Christ is our Sabbath. Sabbath means to rest. And I submit to you, if you don't put your rest in Jesus Christ, you have no rest. Annette from Florida, Exodus 20, verse 8. That's what I just referred to. Do holy and hallowed mean the same thing set aside? <coughs> Excuse me. We just answered that uh, question, so I won't go into it again. I hope you caught the answer. Exodus 20, 10, did God set aside the Sabbath so that everything that has life could have a chance to worship Him in a spiritual sense? And I'll follow that with the same answer I gave the, just a moment ago. Hebrews chapter 4, the Sabbath is rest. Our Sabbath is Jesus Christ. Does fear, you follow Exodus 20, 20, does fear mean uh, his reverence or fear his power. Well, Moses said, fear not, uh, for God has come to prove you. Uh, the word fear there is yare. It's a primitive root. It means to fear morally, but it also means to revere. I think in the case where Moses used it, it means fear. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, on the other hand, says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. And I think uh, yare there in the Hebrew means to reverence God. Sylvia from Ohio, I, can, I cannot tell you how happy I was to stumble upon your network. I have been watching you ever since. We're glad you enjoyed the program. My question, didn't Ham, Shem, and Japheth uh, have the same mother? In Genesis chapter 9, verse 23, why did they put a garment and walk backward to cover their father's nakedness? Yes, they all had the same mother, but you have to understand what to uncover your father's nakedness is. And to do that, you have to go to Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus chapter 20. To uncover your father's nakedness is to lie in sexual intercourse with his wife. And in uh, Ham's case, he uncovered his father's nakedness and that being with his own mother. It was an incestuous relationship. The law of incest had not been given at that time, however. The other two boys, uh, Shem and Japheth, uh, used a garment and backed out of the room in embarrassment so as not to uncover their father's nakedness. Kim from Georgia, I'm still wondering if it is okay to wear earrings through pierced <coughs> ears. I don't believe there's anything biblical that prohibits, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the wearing of pierced earrings. In ancient times, uh, excuse me, some women uh, advertised their profession by painting their faces. And I tell our congregation, our local congregation, do things in moderation. There's nothing wrong with makeup. Just don't advertise the profession of prostitution if you're not a prostitute. So there you go. Mary in Florida, when someone commits adultery and you repent, will God forgive the sin so you can go to heaven? Make a note of John chapter 8 verses 1 through 11. And the scribes and Pharisees caught a woman in the very act of adultery. And they brought her to Jesus and they said, the law of Moses says stone this woman. She was caught in the very act of adultery. Doesn't say why they didn't bring the man. He was caught in the act of adultery as well. But what did Jesus do? He, he kneeled down and he started writing in the dust, the dirt. 
And one by one, slowly, the men got up and left. What was Jesus writing? Well, he probably wrote, John, I saw you with Widow Smith last Saturday night. And John was gone. And Ralph, uh, you aren't so without fault yourself. Ralph got up and was gone. Jesus asked the woman when he rose up, where did your accusers go? And she goes, I know not, my Lord. And he says, I don't know either. Go forth and don't sin anymore. So she was caught in the very act of adultery. Jesus forgave her. Yes is the answer to your question. Audrey in Missouri. I've been trying to catch the time you will study in Genesis chapter 32, verse 23, when Jacob had the struggle with the angel when he was left alone. Then some man wrestled with him until the break of dawn, but the man could not prevail over him, so the man struck Jacob's hip and at its socket so that it was wrenched as they wrestled. The man asked Jacob to let him go, but Jacob said not until he blessed him. My question is this, a man or an angel? Jacob said he had seen the face of God. Is this true? I thought no man has seen the face of God. Jacob sure did. He saw the angel of the Lord, and he named the place where it happened Peniel. And just yesterday, I taught a message at our church service entitled Worthy, and we covered the entire, entire chapter of Genesis 32. So you can either order the CD or cassette tape Worthy, or you can be watching because we'll air the Sunday messages the week following the third Sunday of this month. And if you catch it there, you'll catch Genesis 32 being taught chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Greg from Hawaii, and he says, Mahalo, which means thank you. Mahalo means, uh, uh, I'm familiar with that in Hawaiian. And for all of your teachings and prayers, I had just turned my life over to Christ a year ago. I love the way you teach. I understand more of the Bible than doing it on my own. You guys are really blessed, and my goal is to absorb God's Word forward and backwards like you do with the Lord's guidance and help. And that's quite a witness, uh, Greg. Uh, mahalo. I've really learned a lot and will continue to watch Shepherd's Chapel. My question, whenever I tithe 10%, is it every pay period or each Sunday at church or once a month? Up until now, I was tithing $25 every Sunday at our church. Thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Okay, and rest in love, Pastor Arnold Murray. Until we meet again, mahalo and mahalo again for that. Tithing is, you know, something that you have to make up your mind. What you should, Greg, tithe where you're taught. That's what keeps the Word of God coming and being taught. So wherever you're taught God's Word, that's where you should tithe. If you're taught 50% at your local church and 50% on Shepherd's Chapel, tithe half to your church, half to Shepherd's Chapel. Daniel in North Carolina, do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? I have repented, but I have never been baptized. Thank you for answering my question in John chapter 3 verse 5 where it states that you must be born of water. Many churches teach that that means you must be baptized. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about being born in the flesh. And just before a baby is born, what happens? His mother's water breaks. That's what it means to be born of water, born in the flesh. And the, what the lesson there is, the fallen angels had not been born of woman, born of flesh, and that's what it's talking about there. They refused to be born of woman. Uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 6 will back that up too, that they left their uh, habitat in heaven and came to earth. Genesis chapter 6 uh, also goes into that. Patricia in Kentucky. I am Patricia from Kentucky and I've been going to this one church here for a year. The pastors there only teach out of John. 
I know there is more because thanks to you and Shepherd's Chapel, the whole truth is taught. I'm not sure when I should go yet because I've been planting a few seeds in Sunday school class so far. The vile seals trumps are not taught and the pastor doesn't go into other books of the Father's precious word. I listen uh, every day to Shepherd's Chapel. Uh, I learn so I may hopefully address this to the pastor at his church, at this church. I'm not good with words uh, as this pastor is and I wish to plant a seed with him. Where in Father's Word can I read what to do? Should I stay or go? And of course, uh, Patricia, we can't tell you what church you should attend. It may be God has you there, as you said, to plant seeds and to, to help someone that's lost. But um, the only thing you have to be careful of is second epistle of John verses 9 and 10. If you wish them even Godspeed, which is just a common salutation, have a nice day, you're partaking of their evil deeds. So uh, be, be aware of that one scripture. <clears throat> and I'm out of time, so I'll save this question for first up tomorrow. And I want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. And you know what? When God looks down and He sees you and you have that letter that He wrote to you open and you're trying to learn of your Father and, and how to be pleasing to Him, it makes His day. And I can guarantee you the blessings are going to start to flow in your life. Make time each day to, to study in His Word. Well, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. And most of all, to reach out to your brothers and sisters who are lost in this world of darkness. But there's one thing most important, it's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in the Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.